Awesome. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's such a pleasure to be here, Courtney. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you. So I wanted to just dive right in. I wanted to start talking about metabolically metabolic flexibility because I've been hearing about this a lot lately. And I had a woman on my podcast recently, Dr. Tina Moore, who was saying that it's really the key to getting through this virus healthy and okay. So can we talk about what exactly metabolic flexibility is? Sure. Um, I guess the sort of the, the, um, the main points of it are that, uh, most of humans derive their energy from a number of different sources. We can get energy from glucose in our bloodstream, uh, glycogen in our muscles. We can get energy from stored body fat or the fat on a plate of food. We can get energy from sometimes combusting amino acids, protein, uh, or by making ketones. And ketones are sort of a, a, an elegant fourth fuel that the body makes in the absence of glucose. And the body loves to use it to run the brain and to run cardiac muscle and certain skeletal muscle. So we have, we have all these, what we call energy substrates that we can make. We're all genetically programmed to, to, to burn these substrates. Uh, and a lot of the, the usage of the substrates depends uh, on two factors. One of which is the amount of, of energy that we're being called upon to expend, whether that means we're walking uh, slowly for long distances, which is primarily a fat combusting exercise or whether we're doing glycolytic work in the gym or lifting heavy weights and that's uh, that's anaerobic and uses a lot of the, uh, the, the what we call the phosphagen system which is also tied into the glycogen system so we have all these different energy substrates the problem is over over time um, and because of the way our our diets are orchestrated now uh, because of access to way too much food uh, and way too much processed food, uh, we, uh, starting at a very early age, lose the ability to tap into all these different energy substrates. And what happens is we, we wind up depending a lot on the carbohydrate as a source of glucose to fuel our bodies. Uh, and this has become a, a huge issue throughout um, the U.S., for sure. That's why yeah. so many of us are, are uh, uh, metabolically dysfunctional, obese, overweight, uh, type 2 diabetes. It's because we become carbohydrate dependent. We haven't, we haven't trained our bodies to use these wonderful fuels like the stored body fat, like the ketones that our, um, that our liver can produce. So what metabolic flexibility describes is the ability of the human body to extract energy from whenever these substrates, whatever of these substrates is available whenever it's called upon. And to do so, to, to switch between fat burning and glycogen burning and glucose burning and ketone burning effortlessly without having to think about it for sure, and definitely without, without feeling it, without noticing it. Um, what happens and, you know, to a lot of people who, for instance, decide they're gonna go on a two-day fast and they're coming off of a, uh, a diet that's primarily the standard American diet, and they read about fasting and they go, wow, this sounds great. Like I'll, I'll repair my body if I, if I don't eat for two days. And it sounds wonderful. Um, but what happens is if you haven't trained the body to burn fat in the absence of any incoming fuel, if you haven't trained the brain to use ketones to maintain its attitude and its mood and to prevent it from releasing stress hormones, then that two day fast is difficult and, and it's yeah. depressing and it, and it turns people away. But if you're metabolically flexible, if you've done the work, if you built the metabolic machinery to access your own stored body fat in the absence of any other food, if you've built the metabolic machinery to allow your brain to thrive on the presence of a minimal amount of, of ketones in the absence of glucose, then you are metabolically flexible. Then you can switch back and forth among and between these substrates uh, and experience you know, this sort of um, massively empowered part of life, which allows you to go through the day without being tethered to mealtime. Like, oh, I missed breakfast. I feel terrible. I'm going to have to have a donut when I get to work. Or, you know, uh, I can't have that meeting at 1130 or 12 because that's lunchtime. And if I don't eat lunch, I'll get hangry. All of these things disappear when you develop metabolic flexibility. I love that. So for anyone listening, does that mean that you have to go keto in order to achieve metabolic flexibility or what does that entail? So it entirely? doesn't require that, but it's a whole lot easier if yeah. you utilize the tool of keto. In other words, keto, ketogenic eating, this, this sort of uh, very low carb way of eating 
is probably the easiest and fastest way to prompt your body into uh, making the adjustments to become metabolically flexible. When you withhold carbohydrates, so when you cut back on sugars and you cut back on starchy carbs and you limit your carbohydrate intake to uh, some, some vegetables, not much in the way of fruit, uh, healthy fats and protein, uh, that is what we sort of use as a, a description of a keto diet. Yeah. Um, the body is kind of prompted to increase the number of mitochondria in the cells. And mitochondria are the part of the cells where the fat gets burned to create energy. So creating more mitochondria is a good thing. Uh, the yeah, body is prompted. Energy. Yeah. The body is prompted uh, to make uh, more ketones and to offset the need of the brain, which otherwise has become very dependent on glucose um, for its energy source uh, to now become more reliant on ketones. Uh, and, and, and a ketogenic way of eating is a great tool, a great strategy to, to kind of push your body gently, ease it into uh, greater metabolic flexibility. Now you don't have to go keto. You can simply choose to cut back on, I mean, look, as long as you understand that we have to, we really have to, to, to develop this metabolic flexibility, we have to get rid of the big three, right? The big three are um, sugars, added sugars, and, and all of that, you know, sweetened beverages and all the stuff that we pretty much know that we shouldn't be eating. Yeah. Uh, you want to get rid of processed uh, grains and processed carbohydrate, stuff that gets uh, way too easily digested in, in your gut and becomes converted into glucose so quickly that it doesn't, your body doesn't know the difference between, you know, uh, these processed grains and a bowl of Skittles. Um, yes. Can we give some um, examples of what processed grains would look like for people listening? Uh, bread, pasta, cereal. I mean, all of these things, muffins, uh, cookies, crackers. crackers. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's unfortunately for some people, it's a large part of of what they might eat in a day. But yeah. the elimination of, so we go back to eliminating the sugars, the processed grains, and then ultimately what we call the industrial seed oil. So soybean oil, canola oil, corn oil, um, safflower. These are very uh, highly processed oils that are deleterious to our health, may be involved uh, in, um, in uh, insulin resistance, which is another um, a major block for getting to this metabolic flexibility. Yes, so and we're the, seeing more and more cases of it now too. It's huge. It's yeah. just absolutely huge. So, so uh, the first step in achieving metabolic flexibility, whether you go keto or not, is to eliminate those those big three. And if you do, you come down to a fairly, you know, uh, enticing list of beef, pork, lamb, chicken, turkey, fish all the vegetables that you can conjure up in your head, which probably won't exceed 17 on a bet. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, maybe a little bit of fruit once in a while um, and maybe some starchy tubers once in a while. So you're not really keto, but you've cleaned up your diet enough that, that, that you're prompting your body to become more um, readily accepting of the idea that you'll be burning more fat and less carbohydrate as time goes on. As you clean that up and as you become uh, more adept at burning fat, we call it fat adapted, uh, the next uh, phase is seeing how long you can go without eating, provided it doesn't cause issues with you. So uh, what we want to do is we want to develop um, a pattern where we eat when we're hungry, for sure, but we don't necessarily eat when we're not hungry. And, it, and with that simple little piece of advice, we find that people over a period of time uh, generally find that three meals a day is just too damn much food. Uh, that if you really think about it, if you if you don't tether yourself to a meal time and in, instead you wake up in the morning, you have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, a cup of water, whatever it is, and start your day without eating any food and see how long you can go before you start to get hungry or you start to get you know um, feel a, a lack of energy. Um, the longer you can go, the better it is for your body. And the longer you can go, the more your body is now starting to build that metabolic machinery. It's starting to create those, we, we call it mitochondrial biogenesis. It's starting to increase the number of mitochondria. It's starting to improve the efficiency of the mitochondria that you already have. Um, it's, yeah. it's increasing enzymes that take fat out of storage. So they become readily accessible. It reduces the amount of insulin that you produce and insulin, while it's a wonderful hormone that, you know, sort of regulates how 
nutrients get into the cells. If there's too much insulin, we can't take fat out of storage and we can't burn it. And so we have this ironic sort of situation where we have all this fat on our bodies. Many of us who are obese have all this fat and we can't even get access to it because of the hormonal dysregulation that's happened as a result of the, the way we've chosen to eat. Again, we've chosen yeah. to eat sugars and processed grains and industrial seed oils. And then we've ch chosen to eat so often throughout the day that the body really never has a chance to go, hey, wait, 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 I got all this fuel stored on me. I would love to start burning it off. That's what I'm designed to do. And yet you keep loading the fuel tank up with more, right? So yeah, that's the issue. You know, it's so interesting because I started doing this a couple of years ago, what I call flexible fasting, where I basically kind of similar to what you said was I wake up in the morning and I'll have my coffee and then I won't eat until I find myself hungry. And for years, I mean, all growing up, I was that person that literally the second that I woke up, I was so starving that I had to eat something almost immediately. I couldn't even fathom the idea of waking up and not eating within 20 minutes of first waking up. And when I started learning about fasting and how incredible it was for our brains and our health and everything, I started to just slowly, um, I would just every day I would go until I was hungry and it was not about starving myself. It's still not about starving myself. I mean, this morning I woke up and I was hungry by 10 30, which is not normal for me. I normally eat around like noon one is my first meal. But as you start to train your body to do that, it adapts. And now I, I only eat two meals a day and I feel great. But years ago, hearing that someone talk about this conversation, I would have been like, there's no way that I could go. Yep. You know, well, and you know, we're also the, the, at the effect of advertising, which suggests that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Yep. And, and that was followed up with uh, over decades of uh, so-called nutritional science that sort of indicated that you had to eat three small meals a day and there always had to be protein and a little bit of you know, carbohydrate and a little bit of vegetables at every meal. And, and even snacking in between was was okay, provided it was a healthy snack because humans are grazers and you know this is how we're supposed to eat. And in fact, it turns out nothing could be further from the truth. We're actually yeah. fractal eaters. And we typically um, you know, encountered throughout our evolution um, periods of time where there was no food for days and then there was a lot of food. And so we had to, like you came across you know, the carcass of some animal that something else had, had killed or uh, you know, you came across a trove of fruits or, you know, some trees with low hanging fruit. And that was not the time to start portion control, right? So yeah. we developed these systems uh, through evolution that allowed us to survive as a species to today, which, which it's kind of a twofold system. We have one system that takes excess calories and elegantly converts it into stored body fat. And it deposits that stored body fat elegantly and precisely in the most uh, appropriate areas to allow us to carry it with us th for long periods of walking. So it deposits it on our waist, our hips, our butt, our thighs. And, and so that's why we have these sort of, you know, uh, overweight storage, uh, storage <laughs> you know, facilities where, and people go, well, why is it that I, that I store all the weight on my belly and my thighs and my butt? Well, because that's, what you're designed to do because it's it is the perfect center of gravity it's like if you were had if you had to if you're a skinny person and you're going you know on a long hike and you've got uh 50 pounds that you want to carry with it the ideal place to literally carry it is around the waist not not on the shoulders or on a backpack but literally oh, yeah. as a you know distributed across the midsection so the, like the point fanny pack <laughs> yeah the, the classic fanny pack with a bunch of stuff in it so so the so it's it's kind of interesting that that's we all seem to have tapped into that ability, right? We all seem to be able to store fat uh, pretty easily um, and obvious, for obvious reasons. But what we've lost conversely is the ability to take it out of storage and combust it, which is also part of the design. So our ancestors would go days without eating and yeah. you think they you know, curled up in a fetal position and felt sorry for themselves and victimized and oh, if I don't eat another, if, if I'm gonna get hangry and I'm gonna yell at my, you know, my, my partner. <laughs> No, they just went about their business because they were so good at burning stored body fat and so good at having the brain utilize ketones, which were produced by fat in the absence of um, any other food. So it's, a, it's an elegant system. And what I do is I just try to teach people how to tap into that with ease and grace. 
Okay. So then I'm curious, cause I'm sure a lot of people have this question too. I've heard a lot of people worry about the keto diet specifically because they say since glucose is our body's preferred source of energy or so what we've been told that this, that ketosis is considered more of like a backup plan, right. For when you're really starving and you haven't, you don't have access to food for a couple of days. What would you say to, to that? Um, well, there are a couple of points to make here. Um, yeah. the first one is that glucose is not the, the body's preferred form of fuel. And okay. you have to look no further than to understand that, um, in the context of what I just said about going long periods of time without eating, yeah. which was most of human history and, and was largely the human experience. Um, you know, why would evolution design a system wherein the amount of glucose in your entire bloodstream is the equivalent of a teaspoon of sugar. Um, where yeah. the amount of glucose that you can store in the muscles as glycogen is about 420 grams, of which only 300 grams are accessible. Uh, and, and the liver can store maybe 100 grams of glycogen, full stop. Meanwhile, we can store a hundred thousand calories of body fat on us very easily. That's really, that's 30 pounds of excess body fat is a hundred thousand calories worth wow. of fuel. That's enough to walk a thousand miles. So to, when people say that glucose is the preferred fuel, I just shudder because it's not yeah. fat is the preferred fuel. Glucose is a, um, is, is certainly a fuel that muscles like to use, the brain will use it if there's a lot of it present. Um, you know, muscles, but muscles don't have to use glucose. You, I, you can train muscles to derive 95% of their energy requirements at 90% of the muscle output from fat, if wow. you do the training right. And, and if you sort of live in the context of that, um, that ancient paradigm that says, you know, we are largely designed to be um, storing excess calories as fat and then burning off the excess calories as fat. Now, with regard to um, keto as a backup system, well, it's absolutely a backup system, but it's, but it's there all the time. It's not like you yeah. uh, waste it by every time you use it. Um, it's not like, I mean, it's literally a fourth fuel. And, and anybody who of any way of eating, you're say you're what we call a sugar burner and you're just, you're carbohydrate dependent your whole life and you can't make this transition to metabolic flexibility. Um, if you wake up in the morning and you don't eat breakfast and this might've happened to you, um, you would be producing ketones. Your body's producing ketones. It's already, it's, it's a normal function of skipping meals. Yeah. No matter what your way of eating, no matter how much you've trained. The issue is that when your body's producing ketones and you haven't built the metabolic machinery and you haven't trained the brain to use those ketones efficiently and effectively, then what happens is the liver overproduces ketones and it spills them out into the bloodstream, uh, which then, uh, you know, if, you, if the brain doesn't use them and the muscles haven't learned how to use them, you pee them out, you know, or you breathe them out in your breath and that's mm -hmm. where you get the keto breath. And so, Ironically, the term ketosis describes an excess of ketones in the bloodstream. You're not in ketosis until you've tested at 0.5 or higher millimolar on a blood glucose meet, a blood ketone meter, for instance. So ketosis isn't, isn't even a good thing. It's like, I'm, I'm keto, I eat keto, but I don't like to be in ketosis because when I'm in ketosis, I'm spilling out the excess ketones. I'm wasting fuel uh, in the form of, um, you know, peeing them out. So as you become more and more metabolically flexible, um, and as you realize that you don't have to be in ketosis all the time, that once you've built this flexibility and once you've cut out those big three, the sugar, the processed grains, and the industrial seed oils, and you eat real food, the body does a great job of producing just enough ketones to make the brain happy. Now, this is an interesting, an interesting um, th think, thing to think about. So, because so many people who start in ketosis and start on the keto diet are like, they're buying the meters and they're buying the strips and they're peeing purple. And it's like, oh, like, <laughs> like I win, my, my strip was, you know, 
my my urine strips more purple than yours. Well, you don't win. You're actually not there yet. You're you know the guys who have been in ketosis for ten years or keto for ten years are not in ketosis. They've been they're keto, but they're not in ketosis. They might have less than thirty grams of carbs a day, mm -hmm. and yet they're not they're not in ketosis in the way that we describe ketosis, which is an excess of ketones in the bloodstream because they become so adapted. It is so good at, at making just enough ketones to keep the brain happy. Now, why do I say that? We, because um, first of all, the liver does have the ability to make 750 calories worth of ketones a day. That is a ton, ton of energy. It has the capacity, but it doesn't typically do it because once you get trained, the brain realizes that or the, the liver sort of realizes the brain has a steady state requirement for energy throughout the day. So it doesn't have to big, give these big, huge swings in ketones because you decided to do, you know, a heavy leg day uh, or, or play a game of, uh, you know, fast game of pickup basketball. You know, when you go in the gym and you do a heavy leg day, the leg muscles, the glutes, the, uh, the vastus, the hamstrings, these are all using 50 times as much energy in that, in that work that you're doing, right? They're using, mm -hmm. they're consuming 50 times the caloric energy to get the work done. And, and, and yet the brain, which is running this whole thing is still going along. It's a steady state. The brain isn't requiring 50 times as much energy to exert the force that the legs are required to do. So when you, and, and, and if you get well-trained enough in this in this concept, you realize that the legs are not using ketones. They're using fat and carbohydrate, but mostly carbohydrate in this work, mostly glycogen, mostly actually the phosphagen system, which uses a recycling system with glycogen. But the legs are doing a lot of work requiring a lot of energy. The brain is just saying, you know, I got this. So throughout the day, the brain really doesn't require that much in the way of of energy, maybe, I don't know, 500 calories, something like that per day. But it's, mm -hmm. and it, if you break it down by hour, it's like 20 calories per hour. So it's a very minimal amount of steady state drip that is required to make the brain very happy and to run on ketones and to thrive without being even in ketosis. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. So you can still eat a keto diet and not fully be in ketosis all the time and still have the benefits, right? Of what we're looking for. Good point. For. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to eat. Once you've, again, once you've built the metabolic machinery, once you've done the work and the work includes, again, cleaning up the diet, mm -hmm. um, going keto for a while, just to be sure that you've, that you, that you're really um, cutting back on carbs, um, uh, expanding your eating window from three meals a day and not going more than eight or 12 hours without eating to, to only eating in say a six or eight hour window each day. And then the rest of the time you're not eating. And that's when all the good stuff happens. That's when the body starts doing its housekeeping, its house cleaning, it repairs DNA. Uh, it certainly uh, upregulates mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, it's burning fat. So it's burning off your excess stored body fat. It's doing all these wonderful things. The best things happen to the human body when we're not eating and, and people have to sort of kind of, you know, come, come to grips with that. So yeah. using keto as a strategy, as a tool to get there is, as I said, from the beginning, it's the best way. It's not the only way there are other ways. Um, but, but even those guys who claim to be eating a keto diet, uh, yeah, if they have a day where they have zero carbs or 20 grams of carbs, that's a fully keto day. And yet, if you look at their, their, uh, their keto strips, they might, they might barely register as being even in ketosis because they become so ad adept and adapted to burning fat when it's appropriate, burning the glycogen that they always store in their muscles. I mean, make no mistake, if, if you're keto, you are still producing glycogen and storing it in muscles and liver. Uh, and then obviously using the ketones, uh, as a, uh, you know, uh, as a, as a fuel for the brain. Like a, interesting. So I've heard, I've heard a lot of mixed messaging around this, and I'm curious what your take is on keto for women, because I've read, and, and I will say it's a little bit anecdotal for me personally. Um, I've read that it can mess with our hormone and cause hormonal imbalances. When I went keto, I didn't particularly have a great time. Now I will say there's a caveat, like 
I feel like I just didn't have enough energy. And once I finally stopped focusing so much on being keto and I just was, I eat a little bit lower carb now. So I guess I would still kind of be closer on, you know, the spectrum of being keto, but I don't specifically go keto. Cause for me, I didn't have any energy. Um, so what, what's your take on keto for women and like hormones and all that? Yeah. I mean, that's an issue. And yeah. there are some women who absolutely thrive on keto and just think it's the greatest thing. And, and, you know, they get right in and they have all the benefits they're seeking. Uh, this is particularly true in the carnivore community, uh, women yeah. who have gone on the carnivore diet. And that may have something to do with a choice of, of macro uh, nutrients in addition to the micronutrients that are in, that are in meat. Um, having said that, um, you know, there are women who, um, well, let me backtrack and say, at the end of the day, all I really want is to feel good. Yes. So I don't care how I get there, right? Um, I want to I want to look good. I want to feel good. I want to perform well. Um, but you know, at the top of the list is I want to feel good. And so all of the measuring and all the devices and all of the ways of eating and all of the macro tracking and all of the apps and all of the you know wearable devices they're meaningless if you don't feel good. And if you do feel good they're still meaningless because you feel good. So, so it's, it's a bizarre kind of um, world that I find myself in trying to, to um, you know, downplay these wearable devices because I say at the end of the day, all that matters is how you feel. So if you're a woman and if in your case, you didn't have that much energy trying to go keto uh, and you, 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 you added back some of the carbs that were missing, mm -hmm. as long as they were clean carbs, you know, as long as it wasn't sugar and sodas and, and sweetened beverages and pies, cakes, candies, cookies, and all that other stuff, then as, if you felt good, you win. Full stop. That's it. Done. There's, yeah. no, there's nowhere to take this. It's not like I have uh, the right way. Uh, I certainly don't have the only way. I have a way. Actually, I have several ways. And, but it, all of my several ways are contemplated to get you to intuitively understand what works best for you through trial and error, through experiment of one. And so the, the, the keto template, which as we, as we overlay that on uh, men, most men find the keto template works very well. A lot of women find the keto template works very well. Some women, um, whether it may be from years of a combination of uh, metabolic dysfunction, just eating poorly, and that could go back to um, you know, not just overweight, but underweight, like anorexia. Anorexia can mess with somebody, yeah. you know, for a lifetime or bulimia. Uh, so eating disorders uh, or orthorexia uh, in, in the wrong direction or um, uh, hormonal issues as a result of choices. For instance, uh, you know, we found over the years that gluten has a huge impact on certain women's hormones. Yeah. Um, so sometimes this metabolic damage takes a long time to undo. And you really do have to stair step your way into this, starting with the elimination of these, the big three. And then, you know, sort of understanding what hunger really is for you. Is, is it, am I hungry because it's noon or am I hungry because I'm hungry? Uh, and and am, I, uh, am I destined to finish what's on my plate because that's what they told me is a serving size? Or am I okay uh, stopping eating after, uh, four bites of fish and three bites of vegetables and go, you know what, that was great. And I don't feel compelled to eat anymore until the next meal. There are a lot of little uh, nuances here that are at play. And you, you, you know, you, it, it, I think it comes down uh, almost entirely at the end of the day to um, how do I feel and how do I feel about how I feel? In other words, you know, I'm noticing um, my hunger my appetite, my cravings. What is it? Am I craving something or am I just a little bit hungry? Um, am, do I have an appetite because I'm hungry or because it's the time of day that I normally would eat and all of a sudden it's that time and I'm not eating? Um, yeah. That's so much of, this is like how we eat is like how we do life, right? It's, it's, there's a way, there's like a metaphor here of, of you know, how you view how the brain looks at what's go what's going on in your life and assessing whether there's something to be done about it right now. Um, it's, it's, that's what I find most fascinating about this whole thing is it, I could give you a template, but you still have to be, uh, you know, willing 
to do some elimination, to add some back in, to notice what happens, to um, take responsibility for uh, you know falling off the, the experimental track for a minute. Um, yeah, I'm sorry if I'm rambling here, but it's kind of- No, this is great. No, I yeah. love it. Well, and you touched on something that I wanted to talk about because I remember when I was in college um, getting my master's in nutrition, we read these studies that showed that people who ate less food actually um, age better and they live longer. And I remember initially um, myself and all my classmates were like, wow, this is so fascinating. But we were like, okay, one, that sounds a little disordered. And two, like sometimes I'd rather just, you know, live shorter and enjoy my food. And I think that I want to talk about this because I feel like there's this misconception about how much food we actually need to be eating. And also I think there's a misconception that healthy eating is synergistic with eating like really bland, boring food that you just force down, you well, know? Um, I know. I mean, for the longest time, um, you know, I, I came of age, uh, with, uh, a uh, boneless, skinless chicken breast is sort of the oh. ideal, you know, form of protein and yeah, anemic it's... steamed vegetables with yeah. no butter or no fat on them no at salt. all. No oh. salt. Yeah. No. And this was, but this was what conventional wisdom suggested was the, the healthiest way to eat. Yeah. And, and the good news about the last 15 years with the advent of ancestral eating, which included paleo and then my primal blueprint um, and then certainly keto as the next level. Great. Now carnivore yeah. is that there are now, I don't know, what, 2000 cookbooks that look at keto, carnivore, uh, ancestral, paleo, primal. And anyone from 30 years ago would have put, put, picked these cookbooks up. And said, well, that's way too much fat. And, you know, there's too much meat. And, <laughs> and now it's like, oh my God, look at all the fat I get to eat. Look at all the meat I get to eat. This is amazing. This can't be healthy. So right. there's that aspect, which is, if you um, are willing to um, entertain the notion that fat is our friend and, and we're designed to burn fat as a preferred fuel, that cholesterol and fat are not the proximate cause of heart disease, it's oxidation and inflammation. Uh, and, and if you are- Sugar. Um, sh sugar. If you are willing to um, entertain the notion that, that you cannot exercise away a bad diet, and so you don't have to you know, think about losing weight simply by burning calories, you come to this amazing realization that, God, I can enjoy life. I don't have to work yeah. out that much. I can eat literally very satisfying foods, healthy foods that are not just healthy, but satisfying, like they satiate me. Like, like when I say sometimes I have to push a plate away because it's, it's too, it's too, not too good because I wouldn't do that, but it's too <laughs> filling. It's too satiating. It's too like, yeah. okay, I had, I got that experience. I don't want to overeat because it's so it's, it, you know, it did the trick. It filled me up. And now I feel, because again, if we go back to, you know, the old uh, paradigm of the eighties and nineties, the chicken breast and the rice, white rice with nothing on it. It's like, okay, you're hungry. Ugh. You're definitely hungry, you know, an hour later or, or two later. So um, exactly. there's, there's so many good things about where we're at with dietary science right now that, um, that it does not require suffering and struggling and sacrifice and, and all this other stuff. And to your point about, you know, what's, what's the ideal number of calories? Well, one thing we, when I said, said at the beginning of the show, one thing you realize when you become metabolically flexible and metabolically um, efficient uh, is we eat too damn much food. And so yeah. some of us, myself included, I could get away with eating a lot of food. I wouldn't gain weight, but that doesn't mean it wasn't having a negative metabolic impact on me. So as a runner, yeah. you know, I weighed 30 pounds less than I do now. And now I'm like, you know, 167 pounds, I'm 8% body fat. Um, yeah, I'm same body fat when I was a runner, I just weigh 30 pounds more now, and it's all muscle. So wow. I ate 7000 calories a day in those days. And probably a lot of carbohydrates too. Huh? a lot of carbs, like carb and, you know, and, I, and, and, and if I didn't burn it off running, then I burned it off in, in, increased body heat, which is not a good thing, by the way. Um, they call it the thermic effect of eating or the thermic effect of food. Um, so the body always finds ways to dissipate that energy. Um, I didn't store it as fat. Um, and, and that may have been a bad thing for my health. I was, I was horribly inflamed. I had arthritis. I had tendonitis. I had, uh, you know, GERD. I had irritable bowel syndrome, largely as a result of the, of the gluten I was eating. But 
Wow. 7,000 calories a day. I could get away with it. So people would say, hey, Mark, you're the picture of health. You know, you're, it was on the cover of Runner's World magazine three times. Look, you're the picture of health. Meanwhile, I was not healthy. So then I cut to today, um, even five years ago, when I would probably, I, I could have consumed, you know, 3,200 calories in a day and thought nothing of it. Um, and now um, one of the one of the realizations I had a long time ago uh, was that um, most humans who have access to food tend to live their lives with what, what can I get away with? How much food can I eat and not gain weight? How much food can I eat and not feel guilty? How much of this cheesecake can I have and not be considered you know, a glutton? How, how much, in other words, it's what's, where can I go up to the edge and just to the edge and, and not have it be um, you know, come crashing down on me. And so we, we, we tend to see what we can get away with. And we do that in work too. Like how, how little work can I do and still get paid <laughs> or, you know, whatever. So it's, it's across the board. It, that's, that's human nature. Um, it's not just diet. But then I thought, you know, as a thought experiment, what's the converse of that? What's the least amount of food I can eat and maintain muscle mass or still put on muscle? have all the energy I want, never get sick, and most importantly, not get hungry because yeah. hunger ruins everything. Hunger would destroy everything. So, so what's the least amount of food I can eat and fulfill, check off all those boxes? And it turns out it's a lot less than I used to think. It's a lot less. If you, if you do the math, it's like, you know, what's the, you know, how, how much protein do people need in a day? Well, 100 grams a day is a, is a very generous amount of protein but let's say 125, like even, even some of the biggest guys don't need more than 125 grams of protein in a day, right? That's 500 yeah. calories. Okay, check off the 500 bucks. Um, and what about, you know, uh, 110 grams of fat? That would have been horrible in the old days, right? 110 grams of fat. Jesus, that's like, well, let's just say it's 110 grams of healthy fat. There's 1,000 calories. So now we cover protein and fat, and we're only up to 1,500 calories, right? Wow. And if we start eat, talking in terms of, um, carbs, and we're not eating much in the way of carbs. Let's just say we're eating copious amounts of vegetables, like, you know, a giant salad and for, for lunch with protein on it. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, some uh, uh, triple, triple serving of steamed vegetables uh, with butter um, in the evening, and the butter counts as part of the fat. Um, yes. <laughs> even that's not 100 grams of, but call it 100 grams of, of, um, of carbs there. Um, we're, we're basically uh, at 100 grams of carbs is 400 uh, uh, calories. We're still under 2,000 calories a day. And that would be like enough to maintain any, anybody who's doing appreciable amounts of work for a long period of time, right? So yeah. I'm not saying that I've just created a, you know, a template for how you should orchestrate your diet. But I'm just saying if you, if you break it down into those component parts, if you've covered all those bases, you don't need that much food to thrive. So now we have to decide the difference between what's the least amount of food I can eat and maintain all these things that I said, and what's, you know, and what's then, you know, a comfortable enough amount where Courtney gets to have the pleasure, the hedonistic pleasure of a couple of extra uh, uh, spoonfuls of the dessert or, you know, uh, a, an extra piece of that nice, wonderful yeasty bread with butter on it. Um, and that's where... <laughs> We talk about the enjoyment of life and just at, at what I'm, I'm look, I want every bite of food I ever put in my mouth to taste fabulous. So yeah, who would you? Yeah. When you tell me that, you know, kale is the healthiest thing you can eat, Mark, and a kale salad with lemon juice and a little bit of vinegar is I'm like, no, that ain't happening. No. Sorry. Like, like, so yeah. even if it's the healthiest thing I could eat, if it doesn't taste great, if it doesn't please me, I'm not interested and I'm not going to sacrifice, you know, my chewing muscles for that. This is really important for people to hear, I think, because we have to take that back and remind people that eating healthy, you can still eat food that you love and that tastes good. So while we're on that subject, what does a day in the life of eating look like for you? So, um, I mean, I'll just tell you today. So today I got up at uh, 7 15, um, had a big cup of coffee. I put heavy cream in the coffee um, and a tiny bit of sugar. Uh, and that's my. It's interesting you know, that you use sugar. 
eh, it's just, you know, I want the coffee to have, you know, that particular taste uh, for me. I use so, monk fruit. There you go. Um, and we use, you know, we, with our Primal Kitchen products, we use a lot of monk fruit and stevia. Which um, are great, but, by but the way. a little bit of sugar, I know, isn't going to derail my, my efforts. And I, I think yeah. combined with the cream, the fat in the cream and the caffeine in the coffee. Anyway, that's what I, that's what I uh, start my day off with. Um, I did a workout at uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, COVID has, has put windows on how, what, what, what two hour segments you can or cannot go to the gym. So I did my workout at 11 o'clock. Uh, I had lunch at 1.30 and um, I had a uh, uh, ahi tuna sort of seared in sesame um, and uh, um, some vegetables on the side, a little, a little salad with that little um, seaweed. It was a Japanese kind of dish, a little seaweed Yum. thing. That's all I needed uh, for lunch. And, uh, and then for dinner, I'll have probably a nice one pound ribeye with uh, some steamed broccoli or something slathered in butter, um, some red wine, and uh, that's it. Every once in a while, I have dessert. Although I, you know, I'm I'm a person who's, I've learned that as much as I like dessert, um, the the discomfort I experience in trying to sleep that night is not worth the the two minutes of gustatory pleasure in eating yeah. the dessert. So. Th those are some of the things that you learn through trial and error. And you go, you know what, if I keep doing this to myself, um, you know, and then hating myself in the morning because I made bad choices the night before, um, you know, there's something more going on in my head than just, than just my way of eating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I found that once I started really tuning into my body and the goal was to feel good in my body. I started gravitating less towards desserts and stuff like that. And that's not to say that I don't eat them at all. And I don't still enjoy them. But when I find myself feeling really crappy after a meal, I don't want to eat that again, you yeah. know? And so yeah. I gravitate towards the foods that make me feel good in my body. Um, and I think that's also an important thing for people to, to hear. Again, it's, it's just, it really comes down to, well, first of all, it comes down to educating yourself and being, yeah. you know, having a, a, a base of knowledge from which to make some decisions, but also it, it then comes down to um, paying attention and noticing how you feel and, you know, thinking about uh, not just mindlessly eating, but, you know, if you do decide to have that cheesecake or that chocolate mousse, you know, at what point after the first or second or third bite, are you willing to say, you know what? that first bite was fabulous. That was a 10. And the second bite, that well, was a nine. And by the time I get to the third or fourth bite, you know, it's down to a six, a, a six or a five. And, and at yeah. what point am I now just making a bet with myself that I can polish this off, you know, without <laughs> feeling horrible. So just the ability to understand that a couple of bites of a dessert, A, won't kill you. And B, yeah. should be enough to satisfy all of those little, you know, receptor sites that, that are craving dessert. Um, yeah. yeah. I love that. Okay. So for someone listening who may feel like this is all a little daunting to start, where would you suggest that they start so that their bodies become more metabolically flexible? Well, I have a new book out called two meals a day and, uh, it. it it's on Amazon. Uh, it is, uh, and everywhere else that books are sold. Um, and it really is a primer uh, it, that covers the science of what we've just talked about, about developing metabolic flexibility, um, certainly talks about how to orchestrate uh, and, and do a, um, uh, you know, a transition with grace and ease uh, into metabolic flexibility. Uh, and then it also covers a lot of the other lifestyle complementary aspects of this that we haven't talked about, but are, but are fairly important, like getting enough sleep, like, you know, finding, yeah. finding uh, that that perfect sleep setting where you get, uh, you know, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half hours every night uh, of regular sleep, of deep sleep, of good sleep. And, you know, ironically or, or not, um, a good diet helps you sleep better. So, and then a good night of sleep makes your diet work more uh, efficiently and effectively. Yeah. Uh, you don't secrete as much cortisol. Um, we deal with exercise protocols and how to maximize the, um, the, the training effect with the least amount of input. Uh, we call it the minimum effective dose uh, of exercise. And that was a big thing for me. And you know, I spent my whole life as an endurance athlete overtraining every day, 
running a hundred miles a week for seven years and then training for tri triathlons after that Ironman events. So I was training 25, 30 hours a week, some weeks, um, mm -hmm. way too much. And, and I would, you know, I don't know what was, what, what flipped in my brain that even allowed me to do that every day for 25 years. Um, but, but I came back to once again, not what's the most amount of work I could do and uh, you know, and, and not get injured, but what's the least amount of work I can do and maintain muscle mass and get stronger and get faster like and improve. Right. Yeah. And, and so it becomes an exercise in efficiency. So we talk a lot about that in the book in, in two meals a day. Um, and then there's play, uh, sun exposure, um, some, uh, you know, advanced techniques like, uh, you know, cold water therapy and things like that. If you really want to get into this and, and do a deep dive, but it's a fun book. I love it. I was actually looking at it on Amazon before we chatted and I'm curious, what's your favorite recipe from the book? Or do you have one? Um, so uh, here's a problem. Um, I, uh, I've written now eight cookbooks. Uh, I, I should put it this way. I have eight cookbooks <laughs> with my name on them as, as author or co-author. Okay. And they're great so, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. I love, yeah. I love to eat. I love to eat. So, you know, my, my favorite meals have to do with red meat typically. Um, or if it's fish, a fish with a really awesome sauce, not awesome sauce, but an awesome <laughs> <laughs> sauce on it. Um, sauce. And, and I, I really have a tough time picking out a favorite food. I, I think one of my, in the back of my brain, one of the things I want to kind of get away from is, um, is reducing uh, my choice of meals to, you know, four different things uh, you know, and then rotating them through. I, I mean, I've said, I'm on record as saying that lamb chops are my favorite, uh, my favorite type of food. If I, like people have said, okay. if you had one food to eat for the rest of your life, what would it be? And it'll be lamb chops and cherry <laughs> Gar and cherry Garcia ice cream. Oh, yum! Ben and Jerry's, one of the best. <laughs> but I haven't. I literally haven't had that for I'm going to say at least ten years. Yeah. Um, and same, and yeah. the last time I had was probably you know three bites. I just you know I know what it does to me. Yeah. yeah. Same, and that's important to take note of. Yeah. So before we wrap this up, I wanted to take this just a little bit of a different direction with my final question and because I listened to you somewhere kind of recently where you talked about the idea of flexibility as going beyond just our metabolism and how it's like the important key to longevity. I think you said something along the lines of like the aspect of life, aspects of life require flexibility when we become rigid is rigid is when we break. And I just thought that that was so interesting. And I want you to talk about that for a second. Cause I think it's really important for people to hear right now more than ever. Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, we, I, I, I talked earlier about the concept of metabolic flexibility and the way of eating as being sort of a metaphor for the rest of your life. Like how, this yeah. is how you eat is how you live your life. So this metabolic flexibility certainly uh, gives you access to more energy. Then we can talk about physical flexibility and the fact that um, the, uh, you know, a, a quality life in my estimation is defined by basically two things. Um, mobility which is flexibility, mobility, the ability to get around this world, you know, without being bedridden or in a wheelchair or, or, or you know, sitting in a sofa and uh, access to cognition. So not getting Alzheimer's, right? So if you yeah. get, if I get to be 85 or 90 years old, I want to be mobile and I want to have access to memories uh, and the ability, the ability to, um, to process thinking in real time as well. So there's a flexibility there. In order to develop both of those, you have to be flexible. You have to be willing to, um, you know, not just go to the gym and lift weights, but you have to be willing to do some form of flow, movement, tai chi, um, uh, yoga, whatever it is, uh, to develop flexibility there. Um, in terms of the mental aspect, um, you know, we, we talk about uh, a growth mindset, be willing to learn all the time yeah. and picking up new things. Uh, so in, during COVID, I bought a drum set. I'm teaching myself how to play drums. It's something I always wanted to do. And now I finally, you know, had an excuse to do that. Um, in business, and I talk a lot about this in business, um, it's the concept of pivoting, which is flexibility. It's the, it's, it's understanding that your business plan um, might be a great idea and might be uh, a, certainly a, an awesome goal for today, but to have the flexibility to be able to recognize when that plan might not be working as written and what other opportunities might present themselves that might at the end of the day be an even better 
have an even better outcome for you. That pivoting, that ability to pivot and to be flexible and to, to understand um, that, uh, you know, your brain wants to hold on to uh, something and maybe the best thing is to let go of it and, and allow a new thought to enter. Uh, you know, I, I, Einstein, I guess, what, one who said, you know, you can't fix a problem with the same mentality that created the problem in the first place, right? Yeah. So um, one example of this flexibility was, uh, you know, Mark's Daily Apple, my, my blog, uh, which I started in 2006 as a, largely as a platform to disseminate information on health and fitness, but also as a means of uh, selling a, uh, uh, some supplements that I created. Mm -hmm. And so for the first 10 years of that platform, um, you know, I talked a lot about health and fitness and diet and exercise and, and I sold supplements. And, uh, but as my um, notoriety grew and as the, as the readership grew on Mark's Daily Apple, um, my business didn't grow that much. And I realized, wow, I'm just, I, I keep thinking, what do I need to do to sell more supplements? And in fact, it turns out that that, that was the wrong approach, that I needed to pivot. And I recognized that I was writing so much about food and how you can achieve good health through um, the types of food you choose to eat and the sauces, dressings, toppings, methods of preparation, herbs and spices, the ways you prepare that food are what give those otherwise healthy foods variety and sustainability and, and, and make you want to eat them for the rest of your, your lives. It's why there are 2000 cookbooks on the ancestral paleo primal keto and those 2000 cookbooks still use just beef, pork, lamb, fish, chicken, turkey, 17 vegetables and some root, right? But there's infinite ways to prepare these. Well, what I recognized was that there were nobody, nobody was making sauces and condiments and, and salad dressings that you could use with reckless abandon, that you could put as much on as you wanted. And they not only made the, that, that vegetable or that meat taste better, but they actually imparted some functionality and made it better for you. Uh, and so that was my aha moment when I said, I should, I should be the one to create this line of products that people would, would willingly put more of on their food, not less of, you know, they, yeah. they'd really want to feel better about it. And so that became Primal Kitchen. And again, that was just a result of being flexible enough to deviate from my, my business plan uh, of, of just wanting to sell more supplements. And it became, you know, uh, a business that was, uh, you know, 40, 40 or 50 times bigger than my, um, than my supplement business. Yeah. That's amazing. I actually originally found you through your blog, Mark Staley Apple, um, years and years ago when I was in school for nutrition. And then I remember when you came out with primal kitchen dressings, I was like, I mean, I was so static because this was a, a time in my life when I was making all my dressings from scratch at home. I barely had time because I was working full-time plus a student, you know, in school, uh, also full-time. And so it was, I mean, yeah, just really, um, and at, the, at that time, I still feel like there's not that many on the market that are as clean as yours are. Well, thank you. I mean, really we wanted amazing. from the beginning, we wanted to be demonstrably the best in every category that we entered. And by demonstrably, I, I mean, you go through the list of ingredients and you, there are no bad ingredients. There are only yeah. good ingredients. It tastes great. You know, um, there were a number of, of criteria that we had to check off, but I, I do feel good about the fact that there are people competing with us right now doing a good job because yeah. it means that the world is uh, starting to understand that the importance of of, uh, well, food tasting great by putting condiments and sauces and dressings on it that are actually good for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. so amazing. I love that so much. Well, and with that, um, why don't you tell everyone when your book is out, where they can find it, where they can find you. So uh, I'm sure you could pre-order um, two meals a day on Amazon right now, two meals a day. And uh, Mark's Daily Apple is my blog. Um, and, uh, if you're interested in the, in the food products that we just talked about primal kitchen, just Google primal kitchen, it's everywhere. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it on thrive market, you can get it in virtually every store in the country. Um, yeah. And, um, and, but Mark Staley apple is a good place to start. And if you want to kind of find out more about like how I got started, my original book is called the primal blueprint. Uh, and th that was sort of the, th that was the, the beginning point of all that led up to this two meals a day. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on today, Mark. Thanks for having me.